Okay. Uh, I w I've got some questions now, please, about your contracting model. How many class actions are currently being pursued in the courts against your tier one delivery partners for <coughs> sham contracting? We'll, we'll do another switch, I'm sorry. That's fine, you'll probably be back later. I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, Senator, but let's uh, ask I'm, I'm not aware of any. Uh, is that because you haven't looked or because you don't think there are any? So we, we obviously become aware of um, some of our uh, contractors that have uh, issues, I guess, if you like, in relation to their subcontracting arrangements, and we watch that closely. Uh, in relation to MBN's agreements with our delivery partners, we're, you know, we're very mindful of uh, you know, the contracts that we have with them. Uh, but again, you know, uh, uh, we, it's not something that we monitor. We monitor our relationship with our contractors. So why don't you contract your contractors contractors? Uh, so the, the rollout of the MBN and our operating network is uh, it's very, very complex. So if you imagine uh, MBN mm. engaging with you know, potentially thousands and thousands of different skill sets, different capabilities in a, a large geographic... Oh, I, I can imagine that, but uh, you know, it would make... You know, how do you know you've got your compliance right? Uh, do you agree that NBN currently uses a pyramid contracting model to deliver its project to the Australian public? It, you know, it sounds like from what you've said that you must do. NBN has uh, our own internal workforce, so again, approximately 10% of all the work uh, we have our own internal field workforce that completes various activities, which allows us to flex in the activities we complete. The, certainly the delivery partners that we engage with, many of those delivery partners also maintain a, direct, a directly engaged workforce as well. Again, You would hope so, otherwise I don't know why you would have multiple layers of contracting uh, where people get a slice of the pie but someone at the end has to do the work. Can I ask, how do you describe your um, delivery of your workforce model? What, how do you categorise it? or characterise it? We would categorise it as a hybrid approach. So as I've said, we do have our own internal workforce. And again, we've actually increased our internal workforce in the last couple of years. And it, that's an area that we continue to consider as we look into the future. We've done that for a, a number of different reasons. Our diversity of skill sets uh, in, in, um, in different technologies. And the partners that we engage with for the construction and the operations of the network. Again, we do work with them uh, very closely in understanding uh, the models that they're utilising to deliver work uh, on behalf of MBN. But we're very mindful that uh, the MBN is a very large network, as I said, very geographically dispersed, complex in terms of the technology, the type of skill sets we require. I don't, uh, thank you. I don't nevertheless have any real sense of whether uh, it is just a shambles of an arrangement because it's so big and diverse or whether there are particular models you seek to use. Um, you have said you've got no awareness of any sham contracting uh, within your subcontractors' contractors. Can I ask, though, if you're aware of the news around telco contractor BSA being accused of sham contracting? Do you, I'm, did I'm you sign? Have you signed an agreement with BSA? Uh, yes, BSA uh, have been for some time one of our delivery partners uh, at, at various stages of the MBN, and I'm unaware of that. that so you contract. are they're one of your contractors, but you are unaware that they have been accused of sham contracting. Now, surely, if you are. Uh, the ones that have contracted them, then you need to be able to hold your contractors to account for these practices, and yet, despite the fact that this has been in the news, you don't know about it. Are you not being straight, or, or do you not care about issues of sham contracting within your uh, workforce? 
Our contract governance model is very uh, strict in terms of the way we engage with our delivery partners. There's certain provisions in our How contract. How can you say you're being strict when you've just said you don't know about the involvement of this company in a class action, that they are subject I'm to a class action? I'm not across the specifics. Okay, is there anyone here who is more across the specifics? And why, why not? This is a very critical issue. Uh, um, I, Mr. I've, Roo? I have similarly read the report. Uh, okay, so you were aware. Sorry. E uh, even though. I have um, read. I've read the report. I'm at not. At least someone is. I'm not. Nor can Catherine comment on them because because BSA is obviously a listed company. So I, I don't think you're asking us to comment on BSA itself. What we do have is is very clear contractual terms around the obligations of our contractors. So are, are their, BSA in breach of their contract we, terms? We, we have very clear obligations. The, the, the various delivery partners have very clear obligations to us in terms of how they manage their individual contracts. I don't know if you want to talk to them. Are they in breach of their contract terms? Have you looked? So in terms of the, the contract that we have with BSA, it relates to the timely payments of their, to their workforce, to their contractors. Uh, we also have uh, modern slavery provisions in there. So we have a very uh, well-defined and clear parameters in the way that we engage with BSA and our expectations of those for all sorts of things, including obviously very strict health and safety protocols. We have a very um, a good governance model in place. Okay, so you've got a good governance model. Can I ask Mr Roo how you have applied that good governance model to BSA? noting that they've had this allegation made against them? Um, again, Senator, I, I, given that BSA is a listed company, I, I, I think we've got to be careful how much we, we, we go into this. But there is allegations made against BSA. We clearly will ensure that contractual arrangements between ourselves and, and any of our, in this case, delivery partners, are met. And that, so there is, there are, when Catherine talks about governance, there is very clear meetings at all levels between ourselves and, our, in this case, delivery partners, to ensure multiple things are done, from health and safety reporting through to payments of, um, for them to pay their um, contractors on time, etc. Okay. And we manage that at a governance level. I'm not aware of any breach of contract. You're not aware of any breach of contract. I'm not aware of so a you're not aware contract. of any existence of sham contracting in this case. I'm aware of allegations. Senator. Have you looked, because of those allegations? specifically at these contracts? You've, uh, you've just said you've got robust due diligence. We, I would think on the basis of an allegation like this, you would at least have a look. We, we, um, um, we, let us take a notice exactly what we've done, just to, so that we don't mislead the Senate, but let, let us take that on notice, Senator, or maybe someone can actually reply. Can I ask Ms Dyer who's responsible for that relationship? Uh, I'm responsible for that relationship with BSA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yet you were unaware of these allegations, but Mr. Rue, you were. I'm aware of media reports, Senator. Has anything been done in response to those media reports for in relation to examining this contractor or any others? Senator, I'm, I, I think we're talking about potential. I'm not sure that there is actually a class action launched at this stage. Can you confirm that that has actually occurred? I will try to, um, but I can't imagine that, that these things end up in the paper without uh, there being, uh, being progress. But I would think that, that the intent to launch a class action should be enough for you to take a look. Well, I think, I think we're, we're, we're aware of, um, we're obviously aware of the matter being alleged. Um, we, we, at this stage, as I said, Senator, it's an allegation. Okay, we're not a, it's, we're, uh, uh, we're, it may be an allegation, but I can we, tell you now that BSA Limited Sham Contracting Class Action, this is a class action that is not specific to a wide range of companies. It is specific to BSA and it is now listed with Shine Lawyers. And it says, and it's quite specific, 
not to it's quite specific frankly to the telecommunications <coughs> industry and it says if you are a telecommunication technician who worked for BSA under a subcontracting arrangement you may actually be an employee and owed statutory entitlements such as super minimum wages and annual leave Shine Lawyers has commenced a class action against BSA alleging it misrepresented the true nature of its relationships with telecommunication technicians and denying them of their rightful employment entitlements. We believe they should be compensated. Now you've just said to me you've got anti-slavery provisions, a whole range of provisions that uphold uh, the obligations of contractors to be fair to their employees. So How the, can both be true? So, so Senator, the, the, firstly, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reluctant to talk about, again, again, a listed company. So let me give you a, a general statement. Um, we, we, there is an obligation of our contractors to comply with lots of things, including the appropriate payment of uh, uh, compensation to their contractors and or their staff. There, that we are not aware of any breach of those contractual obligations. How can this we're, get to a class order. action stage Senator and you be unaware Pratt, of it? No, no, we're not aware of any breach, Senator. There's a difference between an allegation and a breach. Okay, but so we're if not aware lawyers of pick this up, they must have a fair idea there's a breach. Why weren't you aware that there might be allegations of breaches uh, before Shine Lawyers were? Uh, we, we are aware of what our... our, our um, Step in to correct me, mm. Catherine, anything I say here. But we, we have contractual terms with our delivery partners that require them to follow various legislative requirements around health and safety and around specifically what I think you're referring to is the appropriate payment of their contractors. And we, we have we, we've rights at any point in time if we want to, <coughs> to, to go and check that that's done. But okay. at this stage, Senator, I'm not aware <coughs> of any breach. Okay, if you want I'm to, aware of allegations. at any time you can check this. Now, you said, Mr Rue, that you were aware no, no, of these no, no, new reports can, from last year. Why didn't you check? We can direct the contractor to provide us with the statutory declaration that all subcontracts have been paid. Okay, now, which subcontract, I, which of your contractors have you asked for that information from in a stat deck form. We, we, are not, we are not aware of any breach, Senator, to, to, to trigger that. Okay. When have you uh, ever asked any of your contractors to provide a stat deck to that effect? I don't know. Do you know? I, I would have to take that on notice. We can we take do, that on notice. Have you ever done it? Uh, we do occasionally ask for information uh, through our audit processes and we will ask for time to time about uh, payment activity, we'll ask for health and safety compliance. Again, like, as I said before, we do have a strict governance model in place uh, with our delivery partners. So we do that, do that uh, on quite a regular basis. But in, in relation, I guess, to the issue that you're asking us about, we're not aware uh, of a class action uh, at, at this point in time. Senator okay, Senator Ms Pratt, Dyer, Senator can Pratt, I... Senator Pratt, I, I do have questions <coughs> here. How much longer do you want in this section? Well, it's... It, it might be a little longer than I was intending, given the evidence, but um, so I can give the call over in a moment. Sure. I wanted to ask Ms Dyer, you are affirming that you are at entirely unaware that there were allegations of sham contracting uh, against BSA? There's obviously been information in the media in relation to that. But in my understanding, it, in relation to is there a class action against BSA, my understanding is there's not yet a class action in relation to that. Okay. Can I ask what you did in response to the allegations in the media in making inquiries to BSA about their obligations under your own contract? We, uh, we have a strict contract management uh, procedure through our procurement team and through our industry engagement team, and I would need to check back Okay, with so them can I ask see... specifically, once, once you became aware of these uh, allegations in the media, did you take any extra action? Did you trigger anything that was outside your overall oversight, which is business as usual? I would need to check that and come back to you. If it would be, I'd be grateful if you're able to do that this morning. Thank you. 
Thanks, Senator Van. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask some questions about uh, financial. So, if um, ah. Mr. Knox yeah. might want to come up. Thank you. Um, can you provide the committee with an overview of the company's recent half-year earnings results, and particularly did these uh, meet the organisation's expectations? Well, certainly met our expectations and then some. Um, the revenue was up 25 per cent on the prior corresponding period. Remember, this is for, this, for that six-month period. We had reasonably flat operating costs. Uh, EBITDA, which is our operating cash flow, is a very, very important metric to us went from a loss of $660 million to a positive result of $425 million. Sorry, can you just say that one again? So the EBITDA went from a loss in the prior corresponding period, for that six-month prior corresponding period, a loss of $660 million to a positive $425 million. So a billion dollar, uh, over a billion dollar turnaround. A $1.1 billion turnaround. Wow. Uh, if you exclude <coughs> subscriber costs, uh, which is more like a capital payment, but we treat it as an expense. Um, EBITDA increased by 60% to $1.2 billion. CapEx uh, saw a 43% reduction on the prior corresponding period, and that's clearly following the, the completion of the build. Naturally, you expect volumes to drop down and therefore costs to, to reduce. And that's sort of well in, well in excess of our expectations. We connected 660,000 new activations um, and uh, and this is why the whole COVID, at the same time COVID was, was still roaring away for us. So we were trying to manage an operating business, still completing the activations that we're, because we accelerated the footprint, the build of the footprint in the previous year. Uh, so we were still dealing with a lot of these. We had a relatively flat ARPU, yet we still managed to exceed all our, our financial and, in, and to a large extent our operating targets as well. 70% uh, of customers are on a plan of 50 megabits uh, per second or more. And, uh, and as I said, this is why we're trans transforming from a build company to an operating company. So a lot of focus on the financial metrics and the results uh, um, in that six month period up to the end of December of uh, 2020 uh, really stood on their own, so. Thank you. And um, is NBN on track to achieve its financial year 21 revenue target? which I think was set down as $4.5 billion uh, outlined in the, uh, in the corporate plan? Yes, well, it, a simple extrapolation of what we've done over, the, over that first six month period leads us to, to be quite comfortable where the uh, corporate plan and our, our um, measuring up to that, uh, those results of expectations in the corporate plan. Um, and can you update the committee on how NBN Co was able to achieve that $1.1 billion, I think you said it was improvement in EBITDA? Yeah, well, a lot of that came from the additional activations. Uh, as I said, our ARPU was pretty flat, so we relied. Uh, Could you just, sorry, ARPU? For the record, just ARPU? Our average revenue per user, I should say. So as the, the revenue we're getting per user. Um, so a lot of it was around the additional activations. So uh, that's where a lot of the revenue came from. But at the same time, we held our costs relatively flat. We did absorb a higher subscriber cost uh, because of those accelerated activations and particularly uh, coming out of uh, the FY20 year and uh, that cost us a bit more in, in, uh, in expense as well but still we managed to achieve a, a stellar result. Thank you and can you update the committee on any improvements in NPN Co's free cash flow and, and what are the factors that might be behind this? Well a lot of the improvements are going to come from uh, a, a, a rapid reduction in payments, subscriber payments to the Telstra and Optus as we have been doing over the last uh, 10 years or so. So uh, that's where a lot of our cash flow growth will come from, combined with a much lower capex expend, uh, expenditure uh, as we move forward over the next uh, few years. So that's a lot, a lot of how we drive the cash growth. And at the same time, trying to keep our operating costs uh, coming down as well. So as we move further and further into the operating territory, we're getting more and more efficiencies out of the, out of the uh, running of the organisation. Um, and can you provide uh, an overview of the company's debt raising history and, and in particular if you address things such as um, why are you raising debt, 
how much you have raised and, and what the next steps in your debt, debt raising are? So it's always been part of the capital structure and the, and the future of the capital structure. It's the way MBM was set up. It was the $29.5 billion of uh, capital from the, uh, from the government and uh, $19.5 billion worth of debt uh, was also contributed. Uh, they were both fully drawn down by uh, June of last year um, and the agreed um, refinancing of the $19.5 billion is that it matures in June of 2024. So uh, we have a, an enormous task here to now uh, repay that loan um, over the next three years. We've commenced that process uh, at the halfway through of the ca uh, calendar year of last, last year. And we uh, raised $10 billion both in the bank, partly made up in the bank market, and we also did our inaugural uh, bond issue in the Australian market. And that uh, we raised $10 billion out of that. So that sort of gave us the foundation now to move into the uh, capital markets, the bigger capital markets. These will be foreign capital markets because that's the, the pool, the, the deepest pool where we can uh, sequentially keep going back and raising those funds uh, all the way through for, well, for the next two or three years so that we can fulfil our obligations to repay the government loan. Um, we are in a fortunate position that we are a national infrastructure and uh, our, therefore our, our risk rating is, is relatively low and we need to make sure it stays that way, which means we have various credit metrics that we aim for. And it's also as part of the, the, the uh, GBE guidelines um, that it, it's requiring us to, over the longer term, focus on achieving an, a standalone investment grade. And if you work backwards from there, that means we need to, if we're generating a certain amount of cash, then we can have certain amounts of debt. And that, it, and that puts us in the investment grade if we achieve those targets. So that's how we're focusing now on the capital structure of NBN. And each time we go back to the markets, um, it, it, we will be able to demonstrate that we can um, uh, show a clear path to meeting those, those, those credit metrics. So we're now becoming a very sophisticated uh, borrower and we're dealing with sophisticated markets and investors. And, uh, and therefore, we, how we act, how we report, and uh, statements we make are very, very important. So we need to focus on making, uh, or not making, in the case may be, future forward statements which we could be misconstrued. And whilst there may be some legal implications for that, the, the biggest issue is it could uh, change the, the nature or the pricing of those bonds. So when we go back out to the markets, they'll say, well, you're at high risk now because certain statements have been made possibly, and um, this is a scenario, and uh, therefore we will, we will uh, expect a higher return for that risk. So it's very important that we manage this process just like any other major commercial organisation. It's how they do it. There are conventions that we need to follow uh, and in order to achieve the optimum result for the taxpayers of uh, Australia. So it's a very sophisticated approach. Uh, it's uh, very high in documentation, uh, requires a lot of um, validation by management and our board. Um, and these are legal obligations. We can't be making statements uh, in this documentation that uh, aren't correct, uh, but they're all historical um, information that we put in the marketplace. And because they're sophisticated investors, uh, they can quickly come to the conclusion, uh, what is the future for MBN? Uh, they just need to understand the regulatory environment. I, I will remind you that we're, we're not known, really, to the uh, foreign markets. They're probably aware of MBN, but outside of that, they're going to rely on uh, information that we give them, historical information that we give them. The, the results from our six months um, of performance will be very important. They need to see a, a, a rapid deleveraging opportunity, which is what, what it does demonstrate, and the growth in revenues. Uh, so we're well set up for it, the markets are set up for it, albeit they change by the day. So uh, it is a, um, as I said at the beginning, a, a mammoth task, uh, and it's setting precedence for, for government and for the departments, um, and they need to be able to figure out how they get their heads around and give us approval to proceed, and that's ongoing at this stage. Did, did, you, you talked about risk. Does unwarranted criticism increase that risk for NBN and its borrowing processes? Uh, bits and pieces by themselves, it's not all that material, if, if that is the case. It's where things are, become material, like if there's 
uh, a change in strategy, uh, if there's a, um, you know, if there's talk of privatisation, those sorts of things, we need to keep the markets informed as to what's going on. So it's careful about the sort of state, the statements we do need to, well, we need to be careful about what sort of statements are made both in the public arena and, and privately as well. So. And, and just lastly, what interest rates are you able to borrow at in international markets? <coughs> Excuse me. And, and how does this compare to local markets? Well, we, the, the international markets are yet to be tested. Uh, and we, as I said, we're using the Australian market as a foundation. And we did achieve some uh, uh, excellent results out of that. Now, our timing was good. And, uh, and the volume was fit for this market as well. So we have a good solid foundation to point to when we're talking to foreign investors and, <coughs> and they'll use that along with our, our public statements that we have and our results uh, and they will take uh, advice from uh, analysts as well as to how we, we, we're expected to perform. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, as I said, the markets are looking pretty good at the moment, but they do change based on stimulus uh, out there. It's about supply and demand. There is a lot of supply out there at the moment. In other words, a lot of um, commercial operations looking to borrow money because it is a very cheap price at this stage. But that then in turn pushes up the interest rates. So we need to pick our timing, uh, make sure we've got some clear market uh, space. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Pratt. Thank you. At what percentage of works undertaken on NBN assets? or on behalf of NBN are undertaken by contractors, please. We'll switch chairs again. Hi. So what percentage of works are undertaken by contractors? Yeah, um, I don't, in terms of the actual split, so from a build perspective, the majority of the initial build was completed by contractors. In relation now that the network is fully built, the operations of the network, approximately 90%, and this is approximate because we do... Yeah. No, I do understand that you don't need to clarify any further than that because I think that's... I can understand why you can't be more specific. Um, how do you ensure delivery partners only engage qualified technicians? We, again, under the terms of the contracts that we have with our delivery partners, we have explicit standards in, and compliance activities. Okay, that so how they... is your compliance activity work? Can you outline the compliance mechanisms in place? Uh, so, again, we have our audit and risk protocols that we manage as part of our overall compliance of contracts. Okay, so how, how does that, what does that mean on the ground in terms of talking to the employees of subcontractors or double checking their work? Okay. Uh, we have a, 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 a quality assurance and quality inspection program in place. So again, that is actually performed by MBN staff. So as part of the, uh, I guess, the under underlying mechanics of the contracts that we have in place, our, uh, our delivery partners have uh, access to an extra net, for want of a, bit, a better word, which essentially gives them all of their work instructions, uh, outlines all of the technical capabilities, what we actually need from them, the quality that we actually expect. So backed up with that, we our own field workforce perform quality inspections across our subcontracting uh, work. How do you... So that doesn't get to the checking the qualifications of employees of those subcontractors, when and how do you do that? That is absolutely a, a requirement for the, the, our, our contractor to make sure that they have that all in place and all in order. How do you double check we, that? We uh, conduct audits of that process uh, and, and that's how we engage with our contractors. Have you found many instances where that, uh, uh, they have employed technicians without the relevant qualifications? Where gaps are identified, uh, delivery partners get a copy of uh, the audit report from MBN with remedial actions. Uh, from time to time, we, we do pick up issues with our delivery partners, but there's nothing systemic that uh, would come to light for me. Okay. Can I ask how you... Uh, can I audit, so that's audits of the process or audits of the technicians. Which do you do? Uh, we do both. 
We do audits. Well, we do multiple things. We do audits of the contracts themselves, uh, both in terms of what the delivery partners are, are, are doing, what they're claiming for. Uh, we will do in field inspections to make sure that we, you know, we are paying them correctly for work that's been performed. And we also will do audits on the quality and also health and safety. I personally do health and safety inspections yeah. twice a, qu a quarter myself as well. Okay. Can I ask? If you're aware of any requirement imposed on subcontractors by either primes or delivery partners that they shall only purchase materials required for the undertaking of works through them. I'm unaware of that, no. That's not, that wouldn't be something that MBN would uh, instruct a delivery partner to do. But is it, would it be improper to do that? It, it would undermine the subcontracting nature of the relationship if the primes were doing that? Uh, I, I would be speculating in relation to the nature of one of our, our delivery partners and their relationship with the subcontractor. Okay, so you haven't looked at that or sought to have an interest in it? Our agreement is with our delivery partners and, again, how we engage with them and how we make sure that we've, uh, we've got a good operating environment in place. And, as I said before, we have a very strict governance and compliance framework in place that we've been working well, out Well, I for can't see how it can be strict if well, you're not monitoring down. You, you've, you've, you've said that in terms of the primes, but if you're not drilling down any further... But, but Senator, um, surely it's... Surely it's, it's the obligation of the delivery partner to comply with all legislation, laws, employment law, health and safety, etc. And they and, and our, our um, contracts with them require them to do that. Can I ask um, if you can please take on notice or if you've got any information now about the number of PTY limited contractor firms engaged at present? as at 30th of June in each of the preceding years and over the life of the NBN build. What, sorry, what, I, I didn't understand the question. Oh, sorry, you, you can sorry. take it on notice. We're yeah, looking sure. for the number of contractors uh, that you've had engaged. That we, that we directly engage with? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we can do that. Okay, yeah. uh, and I can put the wording on notice if you like. Yeah, no, Is, certainly. Yep. Is NBN aware, and if so, how does it condone that contractors could perform work for hours without any payment due to having to um, uh, incomplete the ticket of work due to factors outside uh, their control? Uh, Senator, as I said, the, 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 um, it is incumbent upon all all our contractors, incumbent upon MBN as well, obviously, but it's incumbent upon all our contractors to comply with all legislative requirements, including employment law. Okay. How do you manage, in, if, if it's incumbent on you also to make sure that... It's incumbent upon us for the people we employ. Yes. How do you... Uh, uh, you must have had allegations, uh, had to respond to these issues in the past. Are you... Um, because BSA can't be the only example that you are aware of. Can I ask if NBN Co has the power to access the contracts between primes and their subcontractors? I know we, that's the case in construction. We, we can seek, uh, we can ask our contractor questions and seek clarification from our contractors, but we, we don't uh, and obviously there's obligations within MBN's contracts on you know, our expectations of our delivery partners. So we will seek uh, questions from our delivery partners if we've got a specific area of concern. That would be the mechanism that but, we would use. But again, so, Senator, it is, it is the delivery partner's obligation to comply with the law. Can you request a copy of their agreements? How do you know that these agreements aren't sham agreements? They are becoming borderline sham. What have you done to address that? By, by requiring our delivery partners in their contractual arrange, arrangements to comply with the law. Okay. Do you request a copy of their agreements? How do you know if their agreements are compliant with the law? 
It's in your contract with them that they're compliant, but what if their contracts with others are not compliant and they've breached, in effect, their contract with you? Do you want to talk about the government? How would you know? The government's arrangements. Yeah. It sounds yeah. like you've yeah. got contractors in breach of their contracts with what? NBN Co if they are engaging in these practices. Mm. Well, we, we take our governance of our delivery partners very seriously. And as we look to allocate more work and we do this in a very robust manner, we take all, uh, you know, everything you've spoken about, the way that the qualitative me measures, the way they respond uh, to health and safety, the, ma the way they manage their own workforce, et cetera. We okay. take that into consideration. I know, but you're not, thank you, and I could acknowledge that. However, you're not uh, really getting to the core of the accountability mechanisms here. Um, you've talked about your processes, but you've not given me any examples of how you exercise this accountability with your contractors. So can I ask if you're aware of your delivery partners devolving new layers of subcontractors, so subcontractors delivering to subcontractors to give themselves a liability shield? Sa Senator, we need to be very careful to comment upon legal ma matters that may end up litigation. Um, I'm not asking you to comment on legal matters well, well, you of just, litigation. You you, I'm asking you if you're aware of that level of devolution in your own contracts. Are, are you concerned now about your own liability? No, Is not that at why all. you won't talk about not it? Not at all. But what, 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 what we've, we've got to be very careful that if there are potential class actions going to be launched, that any comments made cannot impact upon any litigation that may occur. That's the only point I'm making, Senator. I'm very happy to answer your questions. Okay. Um, but if, if, if allegations are proven to be true, that's a very different situation. But we're not aware of situations where our contract has been broken, whereby a delivery partner is not complying with legislation. Okay. It doesn't sound like you're looking very hard, though, at we have extremely strong governance processes with our delivery partners. Senator, you I'm have sure. the governance processes with your delivery partners, but that yes. doesn't sound like you are you are double checking their subcontracts with their own. Th they um, have an obligation. I, I repeat, they have an obligation under their contract with us to comply with all legislative requirements, including employment law. You, it sounds like though you're taking their compliance at face value rather than double-checking it. It is their obligation to do that. Would you, if you double-check, you don't end up with your own liability? We, we have, we have, do you want to talk about the auditor again? Yeah, um, so, and actually, Senator, if it's okay, I, I will just touch back on your question for BSA. So, uh, I, in relation, your, your specific you. question to me was, what additional things have we done since the uh, the BSA uh, issue was raised uh, mm -hmm. in, I think, February and March 2019. So obviously we uh, we're are aware of that from a media perspective and we're not aware that there is a class action that is yet in place in relation to that. So, uh, so I then go uh, to the second part of my question is, we are very confident in our governance and audit process that we have in place with our delivery partners that they are complying with the nature of the contracts that we have with them. Okay, does, is that, does that in effect mean that you don't think there's any val validity to uh, uh, a class action? You, you think your company, that your sub BSA is entirely compliant? From an MBN and BSA uh, perspective, the contract and the performance of the contract that BSA have with us, they are compliant with our contract. They might be compliant in the outcomes, but how do you know they're compliant in how they've paid their staff and, and upheld Senator, their own not, occupational health and safety? It's, well, occupational health and safety we can talk to. It's not for us to comment upon an action, though, that a potential action that's currently an allegation, Senator, but Okay. Health and safety. Can I ask, please, for copies of your audit procedures uh, and specifically uh, any processes you've got in writing that deal with alleged underpayment? And uh, if you can please take on notice whether you can provide any correspondence, file notes and communications with the company and file notes and correspondence in relation to that. We'll take that on notice, Senator, certainly. Um, 
And can I just offer, Senator, um, because I'm definitely picking up a, a specific area of interest, I would be more than happy to come and brief you on all of our governance procedures, our audit procedures, because, uh, again, it's something that I've worked very tirelessly on for 10 years now, and um, I'm, I'm confident in the way that we've established that. Well, we'll see. I guess the, the Shine lawyers are recruiting participants for a class action, so we'll see if the experiences of workers employed by BSA matches up with your purported confidence in them. So Senator Frank, I do have more questions from Senator Van when you uh, are ready to uh, perhaps take a break between brackets. Uh, can I ask in relation to redundancies um, within the field workforce directly or indirectly by NBN. There seems to be quite a substantial number. Uh, sure. So with the completion of the initial build, uh, this was very well known in relation to uh, we had a very large project, we were at scale for a long time. So again, that was something that we were very transparent about at the 30th of June last year, that literally our construction volumes would drop off quite rapidly. But, sorry, Senator, but in relation to your specific question about field staff, uh, we, I would say, um, by large, the majority of field staff have transferred into operations. Now, some of those staff didn't have all of the skill sets required to go from a like a construction type activity to an operations activity but we had very open and transparent conversations with our staff in relation to that and some people had joined for a project they joined for to construct the MBN and you know they did want to move on okay so can I ask if you've got uh, a quantity of those uh, redundancies um, and how you report them You can take that on notice if you need to, but I'm interested in your data in, around in the, the redundancy. In the field force, Sandra? I beg your pardon? In the field force? Yes, in the field workforce. Yes, we can take that on notice. Engaged directly or indirectly by NBN. Sure. Are you aware, please, of the number of skilled migration visa holders engaged directly or indirectly uh, by NBN or its field workforce? Across the whole company or, in, again, in the field force? Both. Well, um, across the field force. Uh, Skill migration across the field force. Um, we'll, we'll have to take that on notice. Then. Yeah. It wouldn't be large, but if at all. Okay. But let us, let I, I guess I really want to be able to see. Um, you don't think it's large? I guess I'm interested to see um, that you need to be tested on when workers are made redundant with the same companies seeking skilled migrate, great migrants to perform that I see. same work for less money. I see. Um, as I understand it, workers are being pressured currently to sign contracts with NBN delivery partners and subprime contractors with no corresponding schedule of rates, which is essentially a blank contracting contract, giving them no minimum rate or minimum conditions. Why is that the case and are you aware of this? This is outside of NBN? NBN's uh, subprime contractors are signing NBN staff or, or XM? Well, so, I, I, so I, it shouldn't matter whether they're, they're Sorry, NBN I'm trying to understand staff. your question. What's your question? It will be within your subcontractors of your own contractors, subprime contractors. Yeah. Doing what, sorry? They are. Getting pe asking people to sign contract contracts, they're pressuring them to do so, and the contracts don't have a schedule of rates, pay rates or work rates in the contract. I'm not sure I understand. So I, no. I think the Senator's saying, so our delivery partners are taking on subcontractors and uh, by the sounds, if I'm understanding your question correctly, are almost forcing them onto um, questionable contracts, with, um, which, uh, which I would refer back to Mr. Rue's answer before, which is, you know, our expectation obviously is that our delivery partners uh, comply with employment law 
and the laws of the land, and that would be our expectation. So in relation to your specific question, are we aware of that? No, no we're not. No. You're not aware. I might ask you if you might look into it. What provisions are in place for subcontractors and workers to report malfeasance or corruption in the allocation of work? I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? What provisions do you have in place for subcontractors and workers to report malfeasance or corruption in the allocation of work? So I can only talk about NBN uh, processes and we have, a, again, a very strict uh, governance model and delegations of authority through the company in how we select okay. our, our, the allocation of work to our partners. Uh, again, that has complete company sign-off and uh, occasionally board sign-off as well. Okay, so can I ask in that context, where is the provision of a worker who subcontracted to a subcontractor uh, to access those processes. So again, our our award of the work is to the prime contractor, or so to there's okay. Mm. Essentially, you're saying there is no provision in place for a worker of a subcontractor to report malfeasance or corruption in the allocation of work. Well, essentially, our, our contract and our expectation, which again, uh, which we audit and there's a strong compliance to, is the expectation is our contractor is obviously acting legally and okay. um, in, in accordance with employment. Okay, so why do you think Senator people are being forced to sign contracts where workers don't hands. know what they will be paid? I, I'm unaware of that. I'm sorry, Senator. We, uh, we are un, unaware of that. Thanks, Senator Pratt. I'll come back to you, but I'm going to go to Senator Van for a, uh, a short bracket. Thank you, kindly Chair. Um, Mr. Roo, can you tell us how prepared NBN Co was for the floods in New South Wales and parts yeah. of Queensland that we've seen over the last week or so? Yeah, we, we'd love to. Uh, Catherine, do you want to talk to that? Yes, sure. So off the uh, back of the, uh, the bushfire recovery program that occurred, uh, MBN, like many other telecommunications uh, companies and indeed other utilities, took key learnings out of that. And some of the key learnings that we've now got in action and that we are using to help with the New South Wales floods and uh, the, the flooding on the border of Queensland is we have 15 uh, muster trucks. So these, these trucks essentially provide via satellite connectivity. It's in sky muster. Yeah, they're yeah. able to be deployed uh, on demand, if you like, to these areas. The second uh, solution that we have, which uh, emergency services can request, is we have what we call 22 fly-in type um, installations. So, for example, if you can't get a muster truck somewhere because it's flooded, but you need to get to a community centre or a stranded uh, community, these satellite units can be flown in. And what they do is they provide Wi-Fi you know, to a community yeah. that may be in a community centre, not able to connect to broadband. The third key activity that we've done is we uh, also have uh, enabled now 102 out of 109, uh, uh, I guess, evacuation centres. So these have permanent uh, satellite connections onto them. They're central points where communities can go to. So in relation to those other activities, we've also been deploying generators uh, to power up the network, uh, you know, and we've all, we're now from a, a recovery point of view because everyone's now talking about moving into recovery. We are looking to bring in more workforce into these areas to make sure that we can recover from anyone that has had an impacted service. We are seeing, though, over the last week, we're recovering quite rapidly, which has been very pleasing. And currently, we, we uh, according to the, the figures that I looked at this morning, we, we have about 2,000 customers that are having a service impacting event because of the floods. So again, performing very well, and we now have great infrastructure in place to be able to really step in and help emergency services. Thank you. I think you said 2,000 had lost access. So was that the, the total impact? No, that, that that's the, the current state of play as of this morning. So over sort of you know the past week, 
or so. Can we, I just maybe, I'll just rephrase it a, a, another way. Um, how did the network stand up in the, the flood affected areas and how many end users lost access to the network? Yeah, so uh, over, uh, over the period, I, I guess, of the flooding, we have been, services have gone down. We've been able to bring them back up with, you know, things like temporary uh, generators or batteries. And where it's been safe, we have deployed field workforce. So we have had tens of thousands of customers that have been impacted. But again, what has been really pleasing to see is we've been able to bring those customers you know, quickly back uh, to enjoy their service. So we don't have this big bank up of tens of thousands of customers waiting to uh, to be reconnected to the MBN. So it, I, I, I give you sort of like the, the, the figure there of about 2,000, but we've had, you know, some that have been fixed and some that have, um, you know, had sh assurance problems, but uh, we, it's, we've performed very well. Wonderful, and congratulations on that. And how does NBN Co respond to these types of disaster situations? For example, do you prepare for them once you see a, a weather forecast and, and act you know, then, or is it more that you react once the scale of the disaster is clear? Yeah, no, we definitely prepare, and uh, again, even uh, obviously managing the field workforce for the organisation, uh, I'm across a lot of the other activities that we are going in relation to be able to move staff around to be able to help with the recovery efforts. The other sort of th three items I touched on before, they're, you know, obviously in preparation, unfortunately, for, you know, a natural disaster. So we have that already in play and it, then it's really up for us to deploy it. So they're rapid deployable. Uh, rapidly and on demand and, uh, yeah, and it's it, they're great solutions because mm. they're very transportable and, you know, we can provide Wi-Fi, but, you know, to people that unfortunately may not be able to get back to their homes for a period of time and, you know, it is a way for them to be able to stay connected to their loved ones. Terrific. Thank you. <clears throat> and what other natural disasters do you have to prepare for and, and how do you go about that? Yeah. Unfortunately, we have lots of natural disasters in Australia. So Welcome to Australia. Yeah, I know. Um, we had obviously recently, you know, the uh, horrific fires. We have flooding. Um, they, you know, we have lots of different weather events. You know, sometimes we can have extreme cold, etc. So again, it's you know, like you said, it you know, it is the nature of living in Australia and being able to really have. Uh, you know, solutions to be able to get communities back up and running and the flexibility to be able to move workforce around when needed. Thank you, Ms. Dyer. And uh, that was my last question, Chair, but I, I will take you up on that offer about a briefing on your governance arrangements if, uh, yeah. even if Senator Pratt doesn't. Would be my pleasure. Thank Senator you. Pratt, you have the call. Mr. Roo, I understand from advice given to me that frontline telecommunications technicians have been forced to replace fibre to the curb modems and receive no payment for, in return. To put this in more concrete terms, technicians are saying they are not paid for these jobs, but if they don't accept copying these unpaid jobs, then they're not given other jobs. Are you aware of this? I'm not, Senator, and I would, I'd like you to pass that on to me, please. If you could, if you've got specific examples, um, I'd be very happy to, to take that, please. Well, it's hard, you know, as you would well understand, it can be hard to get specific examples because the reason people cop doing these unpaid jobs is because they're desperate to get the other work. So we can work with you to try and unpick this. But I, um, you know, I, I would think you would be as actively as NBN Co, given the problems we've been outlining today, jumping on them straight away. Well, can you, can you be more specific, Senator, about the, what, what, you've, what you've heard, please? Well, I can try to be, <coughs> uh, but you know, I've certainly seen this kind of feedback come in from unions, but of course unions don't get it firsthand from their members. They have to, you know, people are desperate, they want this work, so they don't disclose what they're being asked to do. So you might be more effective in getting to the bottom of this by asking your subcontractors, uh, your prime contractors, right down the line about what their arrangements are I, and if this is happening. I wonder though, could you, could you, what, what, what you've got and what 
<clears throat> understanding what you've just told me, what you're comfortable sending us, I'd appreciate it though, Senator, if you could. Um, we have our, our um, uh, we've got people in our, in our government team who'd be very happy to get the information from you as best, as much as you can, obviously. I, I understand what you just said, but as much as you can, that will be helpful, please. We can do so. Please, um, thank you. Because if you don't ask, people can't tell, and I wouldn't want to be CNBN Co running a don't ask, don't tell regime when it comes to these issues. Can I ask if your um, schedule of rates between NBN Co and Tier 1 delivery partners is a rate paid for the replacement of a fibre to the curb modem? Does it have a rate for that work in we it? We have, yes, we have rates that essentially, um, uh, when you roll a truck, so essentially that's an act activation of someone going and doing something, and depending yep. on what activities need to be performed, there, there is a schedule of rates okay. for that. Okay, so if someone's been asked to go and do that work for no payment, the company, there's, you would have paid someone along the line to do that work, even if the worker themselves doesn't actually get paid, because that's what you're telling me. Can I ask? Sen Senator, sorry, can I just, just thought of something. Can I just also add in that, that we have a whistleblower line on our uh, hotline, it's on our website. Um, it, is, it is taken very seriously. Um, we, have, we have specific individuals who are then responsible under the, under the uh, legislation to, to look at that, those particular whistleblower issues. But if a worker who was forced to do this work called that line... No, they, it is anonymous, Senator. In fact, I know, but how do you, how do, you know, and you follow up with that company, how do you remain confident that that person doesn't lose their job. It might be the only be contractor because, in the area that they can work for. Because on, uh, yeah, and under the under the um, under the obligations of of, uh, of the Public Interest Disclosure Act, the the so-called PID, which runs the whistleblower, there is an obligation of the company to ensure that when a whistleblower wishes to stay anonymous, that our processes ensure that they're protected. So there would be processes put around that, Senator, and if, if, if it was, it, it actually wouldn't, we're not allowed under the legislation to do anything that would potentially lead to that person being at, uh, uh, uncovered who they are. So I think you can assure, I think you can be assured that it would be managed in the way that legislation Would you find them another job with out. another contractor? Well, we, we would, we would, I'm not sure that that's our role to find a role well, for somebody else. Well, it might be else. the only way you could protect them. Senator, what we can do is take, if, if anybody wishes to send in a complaint to our whistleblower line, we will follow it appropriately. Okay, it's my understanding that prime contracts stipulate a worker can't switch to another prime. It seems like you'd be in a rock, between a rock and a hard place when it comes to this work. Why, is that the case? No, I, I see quite commonly that subcontractors work for multiple prime contractors, so I don't see evidence of that uh, occurring. Oh, and what about an individual worker? Uh, again, I, 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 on individual circumstances I couldn't comment, but... If you can take on notice um, that you have a look at your primes, contracts and down that train to make sure that that's We could, we could certainly ask, ask the question. Have you audited any recent contracts? and found any issues in this regard? In relation to, uh, in, uh, I guess... Workers not being able to switch to another company? Mm, uh, well, again, our audit compliance framework is ongoing, and but in relation to that issue, the we would look at the broader obligation, which is they are complying with you no know, employment law and uh, okay, law. Well, you know, if a worker's restricted from moving to another company, then there's no competitive labour there. Labour has no bargaining power because once they're signed up with one, they can't take their labour someone somewhere else. So in the context of primes, uh, if you can take on notice, please, uh, whether there are anything in their contracts that prevent them, prevent workers from moving companies or within their 
subcontracts. In addition, um, if you can please, uh, seeing as you have taken on notice to look at um, the issue of that unpaid work taking place, I would be grateful if you can give us a formal answer to that question on, on notice and in turn I will try and get you as much information as I can about that um, allegation. So just to close on this matter, thank, um, thank you. have thank you, you audited any recent contracts in relation to primes and found any of these issues inside their contracts? Uh, but the, the audits that we conduct with our contractors focus on many different things. It doesn't it focus on the, the compliance of that of our delivery partner to our the obligations to MBN. Okay, so uh, a contract that means someone can't switch from one prime to another wouldn't be in your contracts no, with that prime. Are you able to look at their other contracts? Would it concern you if that kind of behaviour was going on between primes? Okay. So it can become an well, element what, of what price I... fixing between them so that they can um, you know, it, it helps them kind of collude to fix prices and drive down their costs mm -hmm. if they can control their own workers and prevent them from working from one company to another. What I see is, in fact, the opposite of that. I see that um, subcontractors work for... They will. It's just the way the contracting world works. Those subcontractors will work for two or three prime contractors. They often will work outside the industry as well, so that it won't... I understand that. We're talking here also about individual workers and those contracts as well. You can't switch as a worker from one contractor to another. Um, if you can have a look at those issues, and I'll try and get some detail on that. Yeah, if you could, please, Senator, that'll be helpful. Thank you. So Senator Pratt, Senator Van has a few questions, and I think Senator Kitchen, do you want to go for your questions now, Senator yes, Kitchen, and then you. I'll come Thanks. back to Senator Van. Thanks. Good morning. Happy Friday. It's good to see you in person. You're normally on the screen. I know. I, screen I prefer there. being in person. <laughs> <laughs> Could I? I'm just going to traverse three areas. Uh, one is your responses to questions on notice, which I have to tell you is disappointing. I'm also going to go to the uh, number of visits it takes to do res a residential connection. And I'm also going to ask you about uh, an all, some all staff functions that you've had. Sure. Um, and also just to put you on notice that I would like Mr Knox, who is, it's also good to see you in person, and Mr Singh to come to budget estimates in May. So I don't want to really go through the hoo-ha we had to last year to have Mr Knox come and Mr Singh. Thank you. So you, you're going to confirm that, aren't you? Sure. Thank you. Now, can I go to your question on notice 2766? Um, now, I asked you, I mean, this is despite the other problems we've had with questions on notice, but I, I asked you for the period all connections in Victoria um, how many individual residential connections are there to the NBN in Victoria? I know you might think your questions are better than my questions, but you responded to your own question, and your answer was for the period financial year 21 to date at 25 January 2021. I would like to know the full, the full number, the individual residential connections to the NBN in Victoria. I did not mention financial year 21. I don't know where that came from. So could you please take it on notice and respond to my 22766 two, correctly? Can, 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 yeah, can I, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow you. you, you so say, are we uh, really I'm, gonna, okay. So sorry, in question- As of 25 January. So question yep. one, as at 25 January, yep. 2021, how many individual residential connections are there to the NBN in Victoria? Yeah. You've responded, for the period financial year 21 to date, bracket 25 January 2021, yeah. NBN Co Limited connected 1,426,000 blah, 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 premises to the NBN network. Yeah. I didn't ask you about the financial year, I asked you for the full number. Sorry, who's that, that you're is, talking to? I think to? that is the full number. Um, 
Okay, well, okay Sandra, let, let us take that on notice and see yeah. if we if we haven't responded in the way you asked. I apologise, but we we um, I think we've tried to. But okay. Are you asking over the period? Of History rather than yes, from when, in yes. that financial year. So you Senator mean, Van, you don't need to help. So I asked you for the full okay. for the full number. For so the, the full, full number. number so the number so what you're asking is, as at twenty five January twenty twenty one, how many premises in Victoria are yes. connected to NBN? Yes. Is that right? Yes, as it states in the question. Okay, let us let us check if we've answered that properly or not? Well, you haven't. You've given me the financial year 21. You've given me 2021, 20 to 2021 financial year to date, 25 January, because of course I put this in well, I in January, and of course now we're in March, the end of March, so, I think but I'm, I'm happy to accept to 25 I, January. I, I don't want to complicate this anymore. Yeah, I think it's probably our language, Senator, because I, I wish we had connected 1.4 million premises in, well, I, in, I in looked seven at that. months. So um, if you can if you can confirm for me that that one one point sort of one point four million is the full is the full number of residential connections in Victoria? I would have thought it was, but I will. If you can check, will, that would be I'll, good. Now, is. yeah, we'll double check that now, Senator. We'll get okay. back, we'll hopefully get back to you by quarter past twelve. Oh, lovely! Thank you. Um, with new customers. And I'm going to give you an example. With new customers, what's the expectation in respect to the number of attendances required by someone from NBN Co to connect at a residential premise? Sorry, Catherine. So the expectation is, and again, this will vary from technology. So that we do have on our HFC network, for example, and also on FTTC, we do have the opportunity uh, to self-install. So it won't, it doesn't require a technician visit at no, no, all. No, and I didn't limit it to technicians. What I want to know is, do you ex do most customers, and how do you manage this expectation? But do most customers expect to be visited once? Yes, that, that's correct. Okay, so you've given me in response to question on notice 2766 that some people are <coughs> receiving 10 attendances. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to read you, this is from a very well known um, broadcaster. I won't mention he, the, that person's name, but. Um, So they had, so the news organ, the media organisation, and he and him, they were both. They were getting two connections in, and it took 16 visits. So even if I split that, because there was one from the media organisation, one from the, the individual, I split that and I get eight. Do you really think that's adequate? Absolutely not. and that Because it was I've, extremely frustrating, that, that, not only for them, but yeah. for their neighbours, yeah. because you also interfered with the, the copper in the whole street. Mm -hmm. And that uh, absolutely is extremely unusual. Uh, I would be more than happy to look into that example that you've given. Where we do find a customer requiring more than one appointment, what typically happens is the technician that will visit to do the connection, there is something unusual that they find. And that those unusual things can range from the lead-in could be broken, there could be asbestos in the home, et cetera, et cetera. But I, but I absolutely agree with you, home, 16 is, yeah. um, is a lot. Mm. They also found that down the street that someone had, so the copper had broken and someone had helpfully used sticky tape to put it back together. Mm. So you can imagine the connectivity yeah. in the entire Absolutely. street was appalling. Mm. So I've got your question, your response to, this is to 2766. So you've still got people getting 10 attendances to get a connection as, at a residential premise. I don't think that's... Yeah, again, um, and I actually don't have the response in front of me right here, but... That's why you need Mr Singh here. Yeah. 
Uh, they, are, um, they are absolutely in the minority, but regardless, they shouldn't happen. And again, if I conduct post-incident reviews on unusual things in operations, and uh, what we call our truck roll program is one of the areas that I focus on, because obviously that's an area of improvement particularly for our customers and how we can do things better. But again, uh, it, very unusual for multiple trucks to be required to activate a customer. Is, is this why you're referring, Senator, to the two instances out of the 1.4 million? And then you've got, but let's even go to, because, I'm sorry, hang on, let me just put on my... I mean, it's two Ms. out of 1.4 million, but it's two too many. Ms Dyer has That's also true. said that your most customers expect one visit. So even if I go to four attendances, you've got 1,585 people who required four attendances. Yep. Then you've got three attendances. That was 7,616 residential premises that required three attendances. At two attendances, so double the number Ms Dyer has given yep. us, you've got 49,831 Australian families hoping for a residential connection and having to be home, it's disruptive. You've said that your expectation is one visit, mm. but from this chart, that's obviously not correct. But if you could, if you, in May estimates, in budget estimates, maybe you can give me some more data on whether that has improved, because I think this is year to date, this is to 25 January. So by the time we get to May estimates, you've got another couple of months. So I would like to see if and I'd like you to take it on notice to see if this has improved. Sure. And if I can just add a couple of things if you could to be this. Very quickly, Stein, I just want, have I've got, and I've got 11 one more minutes question. remaining, and we have uh, two more questions. And I've got one more question because mm -hmm. I just want to cover off on some more staff events that very, cost very a lot of money. Please. Oh, so, oh, sorry, what I was just quickly going to say there is that. Um, <coughs> Whilst it, you may think it's a simple visit to go and activate a customer, there are many things that could be required in some very complex installations. There could be you know, additional network shortfalls, no pit and pipe, etc., etc. So I, I, I do uh, agree with that. The, the second part I was going to say is in relation to uh, you know, the evolution of moving into an operational world, we uh, have implemented uh, a, a program internally that is absolutely looking at what we call truck roll efficiency and how we navigate and make sure that we've got the right skilled workforce in the right place to be able to perform the job. So it is doing pre-scoping of some of the work. It is making sure the right tech turns up and it's making sure we can complete the work on the day. But by and large, the majority of our customers are having a good activation and assurance experience. And um, But again, I would be happy to come back and um, present on those numbers. I that would be helpful. And I think probably in this particular case that I'm giving you, it probably didn't help that someone, so an MBN contractor, because they're the ones in the pits, that someone used sticky tape to reattach, to get the copper back together. That's probably not optimal, I'm guessing. Okay, can we Can, keep can I on, just please? ask, I just want to ask about, you've given me, in, I'm looking now at question on notice 2386, um, in relation to all staff events um, the cost of the video, audio visual equipment that was hired was $100,242. Well, um, I'm sorry, Senator, can you, can you tell me? The, um, uh, so, apologies. 2386, and I'm in response, Two, three, eight, paragraph 12. So, you hired some audio visual equipment for just over $100,000. Um, you also, that was in June 2019, in June 2020, you hired audiovisual equipment for $69,000, but I want the entire cost. Um, so you've given me the venue hire, which was half a million dollars. Yeah. What I'd like to know is, I want to know all of the costs with, so in the 30 June 2019 and 30 June 2020, I want to know the entire, the full <coughs> cost of those events, sure. because you've given me bits and pieces, which isn't really what I asked for again, but if you could respond to that uh, and properly, that would be helpful. 
and we I'll pass back to the we chair. We'll do our best. Thank you. In the interest not, no, of not do your best, Ms. Roo. I'd like you to answer it. You must have you must have the, doc, the detail. In the interest of optimising transparency, Senator Van has agreed to put his questions on notice to give Senator Pratt the time till quarter past to ask her questions. You Thank have you. Call. I'll be very swift. The 50 million in relief measures, COVID relief for residential financial hardship, has that expired? Is it still running? And that has expired, Senator. Okay. The 50 million in support for small business to stay connection, connected, is that wrapped up? Um, yes, it has, Senator. The 50 million for low income families? Uh, yes, it has, although we are, um, we are consulting with the industry regarding uh, one of the pricing consultation is around a low income product, Senator. To access those relief offers, RSPs were required to provide data to NBN about the number of end users accessing the assistance packages. That's right, isn't it? Um, yes, I believe it is. How many businesses were assisted under the hardship offer? Um, we'll have to come back to you with the exact number, Senator. How many telehealth services were upgraded under their offer? Um, Again, can we take that on notice and we'll, we'll respond to you. How many, yeah, thank you. How many household premises were assisted under the relief measures for residential financial hardship? Again, we'll take that on notice. You don't have a general awareness of it now? It would seem like if it was a good it, story, it was, you'd want to tell it now. It was, um, I think it's fair to say that we, we had expected more. Um, yeah. Uh, more um, businesses uh, looking for relief and certainly more households. We were, uh, and I think that's probably um, attributable to the various various arrangements what, that were put in place to support people through the COVID period. Okay. What I would say though was that I was, um, it, I, I would have wanted to have seen more, uh, more education packages sold. And it's certainly something that, that okay. you know, Brad and I have talked about you know, at length about getting the um, how do how does NBN and the retail industry work together mm -hmm. around a, a low income package, but also okay. around supporting families who who need to educate children. And so, I just if yeah. I can just this is important. Yeah. For, for, it's important for me anyway, Senator. So, I, if you don't mind, it goes to more than the NBN broadband experience. It also goes to the partic particular equipment that people may have in homes and also skill sets. And I do think it's something the industry needs to keep working on. Can I ask, do you have an officer here who has the answers to the questions that I've oh, we'll asked? Have to, they're so detailed, we'll have to take them on notice, Senator. I'm surprised at that. I would have thought you'd had a story to tell in relation to that. Um, can I ask, uh, in question on notice 330, N, uh, 330, NBN didn't answer the question about how many families low-income families were connected under those measures. If I can ask you to revisit that. It does yeah, seem sure. like you've got an, off, got an officer here who might have some data. No, he's, he's looking at the question notice for me. That's Thank all. you. Um, so what we said was as at 23 November, I think you're looking for an update. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, if you can read, uh, give me the, uh, you've got the answer to the question. Um, we weren't happy with the answer. We didn't believe it adequately responded to our question. Can you tell us why you're right and we're not, if you think you've adequately um, answered it? I think what we, what we were asking is, we, we were waiting for the retailers to come back with all their claims, which we said we expected it to be at the end of the program. So we clearly went to the end of the program answering the question, and we answered as of 23 November. <coughs> the program's just, now ended, so do you have that data now? Well, we, I would have thought we would, so let me, let me um, take that on notice and we'll come back to you with Okay, do you have the data with you now? No, that's what you, you asked me earlier. We'll, it's detailed. We'll it's it's not because you. you don't want to release the figure? Not at all. We don't have it with us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and in the context of your... Um, other, thank you for taking those other questions on notice today. Uh, and I, I just remind you that the Senate requires you to um, answer those questions without, unless you've made a very clear public interest immunity claim that can only be based on very specific grounds. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. And thank you, Mr. Rue and your team for um, being here this morning. Uh, you have agreed to take a number of questions on notice. I remind the 7th of May is the date for the return to the committee. And that concludes the committee's hearings for additional estimates of 2020-21 for the communications portfolio. Uh, senators are reminded that written questions on notice should be provided to the Secretariat by the close of business on the 1st of April. I thank Minister uh, for your attendance and officials from NBN. I thank committee members, the Secretariat, Hansard and Broadcasting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.